Is this your prayer that the Lord will break through some of the darkness that still affects us in this present world in which we live? We need to see Jesus in all the circumstances of life. And my, my prayer this morning is that the day star may arise in our hearts again according to this wonderful statement that that sure word of prophecy as we take heed to it as a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in our hearts. It is my purpose this morning that we may appreciate the value of prophecy in reference to our salvation. Our salvation is often focused upon by merely studying the gospel. And so we should the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it says here that the day star will arise in our hearts because we have a more sure word of prophecy than even what Apostle Paul Peter was talking about in verses 16 to 18 where he was describing the light that they saw in Jesus Christ as they, the disciples, followed him. And the disciples reported the gospel. But what does he say? He says, we haven't uh, followed cunningly and devised fables in telling you this. But he says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Now that's an interesting statement to make. There is something more sure than the representation of the apostles of their experience of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we turn to the same writer in 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter 1, reading there verses 9 to 12, it says, Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you while the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven with, sorry, with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven which things the angels desire to look into. Did you notice that the prophets were diligently searching into the things that they prophesied. Who prophesied of what? They prophesied of the grace that should come unto us. And if you come up to verse, tw verse uh, 11, it says, They were searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the, that glory that should follow. 
So according to these words, the prophets actually testified before the sufferings of Christ, the detail of the sufferings of Christ. Prophecy actually gave the story of redemption. As he goes on to say in verse 12, to them it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister. The prophets mi are ministering unto us. They are ministering the gospel, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel. Think about what they're saying, what the inspiration is saying to us here. The ministry of the prophets is more sure than those who reported unto us and have preached unto us the gospel. Did you pick that up? A more sure word of prophecy. The Apostle Peter was saying, we are not telling you cunningly devised fables. We are telling you what we have experienced of Jesus. But he says there is a more sure word of prophecy. The prophets have ministered unto you that which we are reporting unto you. So, the prophecies, we conclude very simply as it reads there, that the prophecies received by the prophets to minister unto us the things that are reported by the preachers of the gospel. In other words, the origin of the ministry of the gospel is what? Prophecy. Prophecy is the origin of the ministry of the gospel. Isn't that the way it deducts from verse 12? They have ministered unto us, the prophets, the things which are now reported unto us by the those who are preaching the gospel. Who was first? The preachers of the gospel or prophecy? Self-evident. It was prophecy. And so I, I am thrilled with this story because to me, as a minister of the gospel, I am comforted to know that I have not originated anything. It is originated under the inspiration of prophecy. And all through my life, I have heard ringing in my ears, all through my ministry, ringing in my ears, and even before my ministry, when I was told as a youth, oh, prophecy is so tedious. And I did find it a little tedious, but I still remember at nine years of age, where I was listening to some very capable preachers of the prophecy and those who are Adventists know these people of my generation they know the uh, generation before George Burnside John Coltheart these were men who understood prophecy powerfully and I sat there at their uh, meetings and my soul thrilled at the amazing descriptions of how prophecy is, has been portrayed in fulfillment in our time. And as I became fascinated with this, I began to take it up myself as I grew older. But time and time again, I came face to face with expressions of, that's not as important as Jesus in your life. Don't burden the minds. One particular minister was telling me as I was ministering, preparing people for baptism, having to show them prophecy that they need to understand. Don't burden these simple minds with prophetic details. If they, these, Some of the dear old ladies, they can't comprehend what you are sharing with them. What is so important about the 2,300 days? Or the 1,260 days. 
for their salvation. And Babylon and Medo-Persia and Greece and Rome. This picture here, what's all that really going to do to save you from sin? The king of the north and the king of the south of Daniel chapter 11. The seven trumpets of Revelation, the seven seals and the seven churches. Is this important for our salvation? Is it? And I scratched my head many times at these kind of suggestions because there is a scripture which does place prophecy apparently, apparently I emphasize, into a secondary position. Let's come to it here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And reading there verses 29 to 31. Where, it, where Apostle Paul spoke of the gifts of the church. And he says in verse 29, Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. Interesting. Prophets are important, apostles are prophets, but then what does it say? I show unto you a more perfect way. And there we continue in chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity or love, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing." So, we might know all the prophecies and we might have all faith. So, is prophecy secondary here? It seems to suggest that. If I have all that but I do not have love, I am nothing. Many people read this and say, what is all that to you if you don't have love? So what do they suggest? Love is more important than these. And there is the suggestion in reading this to come up with the conclusion that if I have love, it doesn't matter if I don't understand prophecy. Isn't that what comes to you sometimes? And it came to me over the years and I pray today that we can get it clear in our understanding. The subject of prophecy was important enough that angels were commissioned by the Father and Christ to come to the prophets and explain these things. It was important enough. The problem in, pro in prophecy is not that it is not important because other things are important. The problem with prophecy is that there are so many contradictory interpretations of prophecy that it leads to long drawn out arguments to prove that what I believe is right. Have you had to sit through difficult studies because people are in disagreement on a subject and they go back and forth in debate and you're sitting back and going, oh, I can't see any value here. It, it takes away my joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. What's the problem? Is it the prophecy that's the problem? It is man's laborious 
proof that I'm right what I'm teaching you. That is wearisome. What is needed is that what we share from the Word of God that is so important needs to be shared with love. That's the issue. And if I have love, I will not make the study of prophecy tedious. I will seek to make it sparkle and shine as it does if it is correctly researched. The problem was in the early Adventist church when the 1888 message came that there was a need for the 1888 message which is Christ's righteousness because they had been preaching the law and the law and the truth and the prophecy until they became as dry as the hills of Gilboa. And I've watched this happen. I've watched it happen of how dry you can become if you study prophecy merely for the purpose of getting facts straight. Getting all the history clear. It's exciting for the moment, but after a while, it goes dry. Pick up in prophecy the love. The love of an angel that came to Daniel and the love that was shining out of the revelation. Go to me with me to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. Verses 10 and 11. <coughs> Daniel 10, verses 10 and 11. And here's Daniel. He's terribly discomforted with all that he had come to learn of, the, of Israel and the future. And he was there in verse 10, And behold, an hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Here was an angel telling Daniel, you're greatly beloved, Daniel. You have stood faithful through all this time. You are greatly beloved, and I have come now to... In, my, in the love of heaven, I've been sent to show you, to give you understanding. Come to verses 18 to 21 and see what else you see here. Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me and said, O man greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be unto thee. Be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. D uh, Daniel had trouble even understanding what he had been shown in the previous visions of the image. He had already explained them of the... Uh, of the beasts of Daniel chapter 7, of um, the experience of, the, of Daniel chapter 8. He had been shown all these things and the 2,300 day prophecy and still he had problems. And so here comes this love of God that helps him to understand. And notice how as he continues now in verse 20, then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia? And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. 
that there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. Oh, oh that sends shivers down my spine. I'm here to explain to you, and I've got to deal with Persia. I've got to deal with Greece, these ungodly nations. I am active in something here, and as I'm doing this, there is somebody who is working with me. And who is it? Michael, your prince. Who's that? Jesus Christ. Indeed, prophecy has to do with our Prince of Love. The King of Love, my shepherd, is. And prophecy did not contain the element of unchristian love at all, but the Prince of Love. He was right there in the midst of all that prophecy. And so, this Prince of Love, that was sent to help us as we read a state, that statement frequently we often recite it John 3:16 for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life and the question was often asked me What was the world that he loved? That aren't, we not, aren't we told not to love this world? God so loved the world that prophecy was describing. Did he love Nebuchadnezzar? He loved him. He wanted to save him. Did he love Alexander the Great? He loved him. He wanted to save him. Did he love Cyrus? Did he love the people of the nations? And what was he looking at? He was looking at the dilemma of warfare and strife and black darkness of hope as they were fighting each other and the, as we see today in the warfare that we are surrounded with, civilians being slain in the midst of conflict, darkness, horror, misery, multitudes in tumult. And these people that were in the darkness of the tumult of the, of the conflict of the nations, he gave his only begotten son. He loved them to save them. But read with me John 3.16 through to verse 21 and notice something. John chapter 3 verse 16 and continuing after that beautiful statement that we love so much. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. Now notice carefully. That light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. 
So that beautiful statement of John 3.16 tells us that God so loved these people who were ready to perish. Perish by the sword. Perish by hatred. Perish by all the stresses of life, of darkness. And he said, I have given you light. The day star will arise in the darkness of prophecy. The prophecy of the events of the nations. Light will come. But what? Men loved darkness rather than light. Why? Because through prophecy, their evil deeds will be revealed. And they don't like it. Because prophecy is a light that shineth in a dark place. Indeed, in the darkness of human depravity, in the conflict of nations, of war, bloodshed, famine, strife, Michael, our prince, arises. And mark carefully John 18 as we continue to proceed through the discovery of the day star in prophecy. John 18. Here is the prince, Michael our prince, revealed standing before Pilate, the Roman prelate, in the course of unfolding prophecy. John 18. Reading there in verses 33 to 38. <clears throat> Here he stands. He's in front of Pilate. It says, And Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. What did he come? What was he a king of? The truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate said unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Did he stay long enough to wait for what the truth was? He walked out. What is truth? Jesus says, I am king of the truth. And I've been born for that purpose on this planet. And what did we read last week? You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The king of truth. Here he was. And he, what was he saying? In a world of fight and conflict and war, one nation rising against another, conquering each other, I, the king of the Jews, am not engaged in physical warfare. If I was of this world, then would my servants fight. 
And as he was standing there before Pilate, the consequence of his words continued to crowd in upon him. For before he went there, he had already met the darkness of the plight of the human race in Gethsemane when he himself was overwhelmed by the darkness. What was it there in Luke 22, verse 43 and 44? Let's read it there. Luke 22. Reading verses 43 and 44. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And as he was in this agony, what did the angel say to Daniel? There is none that is with me in this but Michael, your prince. And as prophecy was unfolding, there he was. And we'll come to that in a moment. In a fulfillment of prophecy that identifies him there. Suffering. And as he is suffering there the angel with whom he had been engaged in all the previous prophecy was there to strengthen him. Remember that beautiful picture of Jesus' head upon the bosom of angel Gabriel? Indeed, Gabriel and Michael were engaged in the darkness of the conflicts of this planet. And here is Jesus engaging in a way that most people do not understand is part of the prophecy of the nations. In such darkness, all humanity becomes afflicted as Christ himself was afflicted. He was affected by the human depravity which is rampant on this planet. And as he was going and perspiring this drops of blood, and the angel encouraged him, strengthened him. Remember, we've been through this along the way. Michael, let's remain strong here. We've got to come through this successfully. The prophetic picture was raised up in the mind of Christ as much as it will arise itself in the mind of you and me when we are in the grossest darkness of our personal experience. There it is in Isaiah 63. The very thing that Jesus went through was depicted in Isaiah 63. And he brings it on to the very end. And the angel must have reminded him of that, I believe. Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63, verses 1 to 3. <clears throat> Who is this that cometh from Eden with dyed garments from Bosra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. Who is it? I that speak in righteousness mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel? And thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. This prophecy is where Jesus found himself in the first section of it. I have trodden the winepress alone. 
Indeed, as he was perspiring those drops of blood, his garment was tainted. And he was referring in verse 3 to the time when he will again, in the history of the nations, where he was first of all there in Gethsemane and now he's going to be at the end. And there it is in Revelation 19. Revelation chapter 19. Reading there verses 11 to 15. And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. From Isaiah 63, through the, the story of Jesus before he came to this planet, through to the point where he was suffering there in Gethsemane, and then on through the history of the nations to the point in time where he will come on horseback with the angels, and there, verse 3 of Isaiah 63 will take place. This is a special banning prophecy and when the heart is overwhelmed in the darkness of the lifespan that you and I live in just now there is prophecy that will illuminate our darkness as it did for Jesus let's turn there to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and we read verses 6 and 7. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Oh, in the darkness, when our mind can only comprehend reasoning from cause to effect and everything is no hope, everything looks absolutely disastrous. And I don't know whether you've experienced it as I have. You cannot make sense of anything anymore. We are a people, a mind, an intelligent mind that wants to see sense and nothing makes sense in the events of life around you. And as darkness is in your heart and you look at prophecy, God who can bring light out of darkness shines in the darkness of your heart and the day star arises. This is what happened to Jesus that kept him going when he came and fulfilled prophecy. And when he comes again to fulfill prophecy, it is of, of imperative need that I have a knowledge of prophecy to be saved out of that darkness. So travel with me through prophecy, to find Jesus, the day star, 
that can arise in our hearts by a correct appreciation of prophecy. Come with me to the first advent, which I've just been alluding to there. If you were there in the time of Christ, you saw a man. And if today a man would arise and says all that Jesus said, how would you respond? Hmm? Would you say, yeah, 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 that's Jesus Christ? How do you know? Well, he's doing all the works of Jesus Christ. How do you know that that's Jesus? In fact, we are told that false Christ will arise. But back there, there was Jesus and the church. The leaders of the church did not believe and accept him. Why not? What was the problem? Would you have been any different to the people of that time? If you were there, notice what it said in John chapter 1, verse 9 to 11. John chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. It says, That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Jesus was the light. He was in the world. And the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, and so on. So here's the picture. In the time of the first advent, he, the Son of God, came. He who created us came, and he was not received by his church. There was darkness. The bewilderment and the confusion of the minds of the believers was, where is Jesus? Where is the Son of God? We, you know, we believe that he might be the one, but we're not sure now because the leaders and the teachers of prophecy, of, of the law, are not in agreement with him. Oh, is that, does that sound familiar? How confused are the minds of the people today with all the different doctrines that are being taught, even in the ranks of Adventism? Are they all in harmony and agreement with one another? Same thing as back there. What was the darkness? Let me read here in Desire of Ages, page 32. Desire of Ages, page 32. I read here in paragraph 4. It says, As the Jews had departed from God, faith had grown dim and hope had well nigh ceased to illuminate the future. Darkness, wasn't it? The words of the prophets were uncomprehended. To the masses of the people, death was a dread mystery. Beyond was uncertainty and gloom. And we are told they were dwelling in the land of the, of the uh, shadow of death. Darkness. The most horrible oppression that they were living under at the first advent. On page 27 it's written in paragraph 1. For more than a thousand years, the Jewish people had awaited the Savior's coming. Upon this event, they had rested their brightest hopes in song and prophecy, in temple rites and household prayer. They had enshrined his name. And yet, at his coming, they knew him not. The beloved of heaven was to them as a root out of a dry ground. He had no form or comeliness, and they saw in him no beauty that they should desire him. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Oh dear, 
What a sad story. And how is it today? What did I read? The Jews had departed from God, faith had grown dim, and hope had well nigh ceased to eliminate the future. The words of the prophets were uncomprehended. Uncomprehended. And because those words were uncomprehended, what happened? How important was prophecy to them? Could they be saved without it? How can they recognize Jesus? Have a quick look with me. Just a few little prophecies that I d I help, would have helped them to be able to see light in the darkness. In Matthew, we read several uh, uh, re references to Old Testament prophecies which will hasten our quick research to identify the daylight that was shining in their time which they were un not comprehending. Matthew chapter 1 I'm reading here verse 22 he was Joseph in perplexity huh, his espoused wife was pregnant oh dear what a darkness he loved her and it said while he thought on these things he was going to put her away the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream saying Joseph thou son of David fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost and she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was written which was spoken by the, of the Lord by the prophet saying behold a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son that was written in Isaiah 7 a prophecy so to Joseph now oh this is it a virgin shall bring forth a son prophecy had made it clear another dark patch chapter 2 of Matthew verse 5 and 6 this is a ter terrible time they had to go and leave Nazareth and she was pregnant and what a thing to do to ride on donkey back when you're ready to give birth jolt 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 M mothers you remember what it was like how would you like to go on a donkey just at the time of birth here it is. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Fascinating, isn't it, that the Jews actually told the three wise virgins, or Herod, that that's where it's going to be, because they knew the prophecy. And still they didn't comprehend it. Weird. You can actually prove prophecy and still not comprehend it. That's what we're observing here. But the point was that here was prophecy. And if they would have listened to prophecy, they could have saved their soul. In chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Then he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. There was another dark patch. The child was in danger of being slain. Blackness, horrible, horrible. And was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. <laughs> Prophecy. If only they would have listened and comprehended to prophecy. And then we come to, chapter, to verse 17 and 18. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, in Rama was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping, a great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not, because Herod has slain all the babies. Prophecy to identify light out of darkness. Verse 23, And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall 
be called a Nazarene. And besides all that, we know Daniel chapter 9, 25 and 26. What was written there? A time prophecy. That, let's go there and read the time prophecy, which they could have known if they would have comprehended. And how important was this time prophecy? Daniel 9, this is the 2,300 day prophecy. If they would have known the 2,300 day prophecy, they would have recognized Jesus when he was baptized. John 9, 25. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression. Yes, indeed. Here is the, um, the prophecy there. The 70-year prophecy, the 70-week prophecy. The building of Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. Here it is. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in the everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. If they would have gone into this 2300 day prophecy they would have recognized Jesus when he was baptized right on time in 27 AD. But they did not comprehend prophecy. Isaiah 53 told them what he would be suffering. And they jeered at him when prophecy was fulfilling. And by failing to heed prophecy... The disciples, heartbroken that Jesus was now taken from them in death. They couldn't see any value. Why? Because they didn't comprehend prophecy. Jesus had to restore them as they were walking on the road to Emmaus. Luke 24, 25 to 27, where he said to them, O oh, you foolish not knowing what is written in the prophets. And he showed them from the prophecies. And then they said, Did not our heart burn within us as he spoke to us in the way? For us today, prophecy is even more imperative than for them. Because they rejected prophecy, what was their dilemma? What was their dilemma? The uh, words of Jesus were very, very sobering. Let's go to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Verse 41 to 44. When he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes, for the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and can pass thee around and keep thee in on every side. Wow. And what a heartache. What a destruction of Jerusalem. What a disaster that could have been averted if they would have obeyed prophecy. Say, is prophecy important for your salvation? It is imperative. There is a beautiful prophecy of the detail of your salvation that you can never find in the Gospels. 
and I want to spend that time with you next Sabbath that you may have, in reference to your and my sins, a light that shines in darkness when sin overwhelms us. Prophecy gives a description that saves our soul. And it's because of that ignorance that the Christians of today, this lovesick, sentimental Christianity has taken root and you just believe in Jesus and it matters not. Whatever you ha happens to you, you're going to be all right. Just love. Love with the prophecies, yes. How important is it for us then, if we want to be saved in these last days, upon whom the ends of the world is come, is God concerned about you and me that he has given us enough prophetic light to identify our salvation? Like in the first advent, do we turn with loathing from the prophecy to something that is a bit lighter. Because the debate over prophecy and the true interpretation of prophecy renders it tedious. Shall we walk away because it's so heavy? That it's so difficult? The, appar the, the apparently most tedious prophecy, the most tedious prophecy in my experience of study, carries within its bosom the preciousness of the Savior. The revelation of salvation in the most tedious prophecy of study. A practical way of salvation is denoted in that prophecy practical terms which we need to understand if we're going to survive the most severe darkness that is coming upon us in the time of Jacob's trouble. If I do not have this prophecy correct, I will be caught unawares. Jesus warned about it. Turn with me again to Daniel chapter 10 through to 12. The whole chapter, I'm not going to spend this time here going over those three chapters, but in those three chapters is one vision. And that one vision is the most difficult study of unraveling the prophecies that are throughout the books of the Bible. This is the most difficult. And it took me some years to see the value of studying it. And when I finally did, I fell out of all blue skies. I met Jesus like I have never met him before. And he still vibrates within my heart when I look at Daniel chapter 10 through to 12. This is the entire vision. And recall what we read there in Daniel 10, 10 verse 12 to 14. Let's go back and let's have a look at a few snippets here to see what a valuable description of the day star is portrayed here in the darkness of the human conflicts that existed over those years from the time that it was given through to our time now. Daniel chapter 10 verse 12 to 14, it says, Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. Oh, what a wonderful thing here. He would come and show what God's people will be going through in the latter days. Are you interested? So that you may know beforehand that when it's happening, you don't have to become 
destroyed like the Jews who didn't comprehend the prophecies. Notice verse 21. I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. I will show thee what is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael your prince. So he began to proceed from verse, chapter 11 onwards. He proceeded to take Daniel point by point through the unfulfilled history in minute detail from Persia to Greece and its split when Alexander was died and it split into four and then as the conflict among the nations, amongst Greece took place, among the generals, it goes into the detail of its being split finally into the north and the south. And that continues from that item through to Rome, through to Augustus Caesar, and Augustus Caesar was the one who caused Jesus to have to be born in Bethlehem by calling them for a census in Bethlehem to make this unpleasant journey of a woman ready to give birth on, on donkey back. I mean, a horse would have been better, but they were so poor. They could only ride a donkey, and that was rough. And then Tiberius Caesar, during which reign Jesus was baptized, and during which reign Jesus was crucified, Let's read it. Daniel 11, 20 to 22. Daniel 11, 20 to 22. There it is now, Augustus Caesar. Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. That was Augustus, the Augustian period. But within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person. That was Tiberius Caesar. To whom they shall not give the honor of thy kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him, and they shall be broken, and he shall be broken, Yea, also the prince of the covenant. What? The prince of the covenant will be broken in the period of Tiber Tiberius Caesar. And there you have the story of this prophecy, if it would have been understood, that under Augustus Caesar, the gathering of the taxes, the Augustian period, Jesus would be born. There you have, under Tiberius Caesar, that he was, that he was baptized. And there you have, under Tiberius Caesar, that Pilate had him arraigned up before him in the hall of judgment. And there Jesus was talking as we read before. And there we read Desire of Ages, page 32, paragraph 1 onwards. Desire of Ages, page 32. And we let the spirit of prophecy help us to appreciate what we are seeing here. It says, Like the stars in the vast circuit of their appointed path, God's purposes know no haste and no delay. God's purposes. You watch the stars. Isn't it an amazing story to study? Through the symbols of the great darkness and the smoking furnace, God had revealed to Abraham the bondage of Israel in Egypt. There the story of Egyptian captivity was shown through what? Through the symbols of darkness and smoking furnace. And so on. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. When the fullness of time was come. You go through this, this painstaking study of Daniel chapter 10 and 11 and 12 and it's a wow, a long drawn out study. But wow, what you come to at the end is profound. It says here, Providence had directed, Providence had directed the movements of nations and the tide of 
human impulse and influence until the world was ripe for the coming of the Deliverer. Oh, you study that in Daniel 11. Human impulse and influence until the world was ripe for the coming of the Deliverer. The nations were united under one government, Rome. One language was widely spoken and was everywhere recognized as the language of literature. From all lands, the Jews of the dispersion gathered to Jerusalem to annual feasts. As these returned to the places of their sojourn, they could spread throughout the world the tidings of the Messiah's coming. At this time, the systems of heathenism were losing their hold upon the people. Men were weary of pageant and fable. They longed for a religion that could satisfy the heart. While the light of truth seemed to have departed from among them, there were souls who were looking for light and who were filled with perplexity and sorrow. They were thirsting for a knowledge of the living God and for some assurance of a life beyond the grave. And there it was in prophecy. And the Jews did not comprehend it. The wonderful opportunity for a worldwide knowledge, as it was in Nebuchadnezzar, when Nebuchadnezzar submitted, it could have happened there. Darkness prevailed. Why? Because of lack of the knowledge of prophecy. And from that point in time, the detail of Daniel chapter 11 continues to unfold right through to Daniel chapter 11, verse 45 and 12, verse 1. Come there. Now comes in a very important point. Because if we don't have this correct, we will be in the same dilemma as the Jews. Here it is. In verse 45, the king of the north, and he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Now what did we just read here? This is the time of the close of probation. When? When the king of the north shall come to his end and none shall help him. If we have a wrong concept of the king of the north, and there is a wrong concept. Some people teach that the king of the north is the papacy. And when will the papacy come to his end? The papacy will come to his end when Jesus comes and he is thrown into the lake of fire. But if we believe it's the Catholic Church that is the king of the north, I'm going to be waiting past the time of trouble, waiting for Jesus to come. And that's what people are teaching. They are saying that when Jesus comes, you will be changed. When Jesus comes, the, all these destructions, and therefore they are misconstruing the whole story. And Jesus gave a warning. Jesus gave a warning when he was on earth to this very problem. Let's go there to Matthew 24, verses 42 to 44. Matthew, and brethren and sisters, this is salvation. And if we do not have it right, can we be saved? Matthew, here Jesus warns, watch, study carefully. Matthew 24. Reading verse 30, verse 42 to 44. Watch, therefore, says Jesus, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, 
the Son of Man cometh. What is he saying? Watch. Carefully watch because it's going to catch you unawares. If you're not watching, you will be caught in the time of Jacob's trouble and you will not be saved. So what is Jesus saying? We're to watch for his coming. What coming is he referred to? Is it the physical coming of Jesus? And I read it now to help us get it straight. In Testimony, Volume 2, page 190. Page 190 of, of uh, Testimony, Volume 2. It says, what time is here referred to? Not to the revelation of Christ in the clouds of heaven to find a people asleep. No but to his return from his ministration in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. When he lays off his priestly attire and clothes himself with garments of vengeance, and when the mandate goes forth, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. Brethren and sisters, the prophecy of Daniel chapter 11, if we will know it and understand it, will help us not to be caught unawares. As we see the king of the north coming to his end, and none shall help him, we will know what Jesus meant, that we must be ready. We will know that in all this prophetic description of the gospel of Jesus, how we are going to be saved by correctly understanding the story of Daniel chapter 11. Come with me back to Daniel 11 and read here what is described for those in this period of time that need to understand what they must do to be ready. Daniel chapter 11, 31 through to 35. And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt, shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God, the people that do know their God, shall be strong to do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame by captivity and by spoil many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be holpen with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. What did it just say there? If I'm going to be found ready for Jesus to finish his work in the sanctuary, what must I go through? And it's a going through an experience that is blackness to you. You will fall to try you. When you fall, do you think, well, that's too late now, I'm finished. No, you will fall to try you and to purge you, to make you white even to the time of the end. So that when we go through these dark patches of our experience, prophecy illuminates the experience and says, you're going through what can save you if you will do as Jesus did. And you've got no idea how much this means to me, brethren. And I hope and pray that we can pick this up in our own experience, that when you have fallen, drastically in a way that is unforgivable and you take hold of the Gethsemane experience of Jesus and you see light because you have fallen to purge you not to destroy you this is part of the preparation for these last days and those who are not watching those who are not 
vividly appreciative of these things will lose their way as did the Jews. If we have a false comprehension of anything of God's word and that is necessary for the time in which we live, we will not be saved. In summary, our salvation is manifest via prophecy. That's what we read, didn't we? Our time, as at the first advent, is a time of darkness. We're all looking for Jesus to come. And yet, it has delayed so long. Darkness. Let us learn from the Jewish church the importance of Daniel 12, verse 10. I read it to you last time. The wise will understand. The importance of Revelation 1, 1 to 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ. As you plow through the seven trumpets, as you plow through the seven churches, as you plow through the seven seals, you will be revealed, to you will be revealed Jesus Christ. where you stand with him today and the hope you have of salvation. May God add his blessings to these things and may we continue to keep a mind focused upon the pure reading of prophecy and all of God's word so that we may have salvation. It's my prayer. Amen.